Aperture. Hi, good evening. My name is Michael Famagetti. I'm the editor of Aperture Magazine. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, it looks like we have a really um, great sized audience. So thank you all for being here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, the magazine was founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for photography. Aperture Today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Tonight, we are thrilled to be joined by Pilar Tompkins Rivas and Elizabeth Ferrer to celebrate the winter issue of Aperture Magazine, Latinx, guest edited by Tompkins Rivas, who is the chief curator and deputy director of curatorial and collections at the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art in Los Angeles. Previously, Tompkins Rivas served as director and chief curator at the Vincent Price Art Museum. Prior to that, she served as the coordinator of curatorial initiatives at LACMA. I am so, so grateful to Pilar for rigorously and thoughtfully guest editing our winter issue of the magazine, a truly monumental and capacious issue full of incredible writing and photographs that span a century of image making, connecting historical and contemporary photography and covering the themes of political resistance, family and community, fashion and culture, and the complexity of identity in American life. Or as Pilar writes in her powerful introduction to the issue, quote, photography from the 19th century to 2021 presents a push pull of image making across a spectrum of history and futurity. The photographers in this issue bring visibility to Latinx experiences. We are also honored to have Pilar in conversation with Elizabeth Ferrer, chief curator at BRIC, a multidisciplinary arts organization in Brooklyn. She is also a scholar of Latinx and Mexican photography. Her book, Latinx Photography in the United States, A Visual History, was published in 2021 by the University of Washington Press to wide critical acclaim. Ferrer has curated exhibitions for the Smithsonian, El Museo del Barrio, and FOCO, the Wallach Art Gallery at Columbia University, and the Americas Society. She has also published extensively, including a book on the Mexican modernist Lola Alvarez Bravo, published by Aperture in 20, uh, 2006. And that book was accompanied by a traveling exhibition. Aperture is a not-for-profit organization. And I wanna just shout out to our generous supporters, the Kanakia Foundation, John Stryker and Slobodan Randilovich, Thomas and Susan Dunn, lead support for the winter issue of Aperture Magazine is provided by the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation. Further generous support is provided by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. And Aperture programs are made possible in part by the New York State Council on the Arts. Um, we will take question and, uh, questions at the end of the program. So you can see the Q&A box, which I'm sure everyone is very familiar with after two years on Zoom um, at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to get to them towards the end of the evening. And now I'd like to hand it over to Pilar. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Michael, for that really kind introduction. And I really wanna thank everyone who's joining us online tonight. I am speaking to you from Whittier, California, the ancestral home of the Tongva people who've cared for this land for generations. And as we begin, I wanna express my deep gratitude to the Aperture team. It's been a tremendous pleasure to collaborate with you all. Um, Michael from Getty, Brendan Emzer, Nicole Achimpong are incredible. And this issue reflects many great conversations and dialogues with them. Thank you for your voices and opinions, all of which shape the publication in critical and important ways. And I have to say, I really enjoyed the editorial process working with you. So thank you for making this issue the best that it could be. And I also wanna thank the rest of the Aperture team, including Sarah Meister, as well as Emily Stewart and Annette Booth for your support. Producing this edition of Aperture was an opportunity to highlight the work of roughly 30 photographers and artists and 14 writers and scholars. And I wanna thank all of them and their representatives for contributing to this issue. This was something of a dream to be able to collaborate with so many amazing individuals. Exhibitions, which is what I'm normally working on, aren't always the platform 
to be able to do everything that you want to do. Um, and so the form of the magazine has been a really special opportunity for me to enlist the images, work, thinking, and talent of so many people that I greatly admire and appreciate. It also provides me the chance to be in dialogue with Elizabeth Ferrer, who I'm really honored to be in conversation with tonight. Elizabeth's book on Latinx photography is the kind of critical resource that enables us to learn, engage, and teach the history of image making and photography by Latinx artists in a substantive, complex, and meaningful way. So to kind of begin, as I mentioned, I'm speaking to you from Whittier, which is part of the traditional Tonga territory of Southern California. Um, but this land that I'm sitting on was also previously the Rancho Paso de Bartolo, a Mexican land grant that became the property of Pio Pico, who was the last governor of Alta California under Mexican rule. And I'm only about five miles away from the site of the Battle of the Rio San Gabriel on the San Gabriel River, uh, which was fought on the Rancho Paso de Bartolo in 1847 as part of a series of battles for control of Los Angeles during the Mexican-American War. I mentioned this because I'm really fascinated with the processes by which Latinos became part of the US. This was Mexico only about five generations ago, and Latino LA is still here on this same site. But there are so many different routes and paths for the development of Latinx populations that have happened historically and which are still happening today. The multiplicity of experiences and histories of the some 60 million Latinx in the United States today was important for me to call out in my introduction. Within the selection of topics and featured photographers, I wanted to make sure that the idea of an expanded notion of what can constitute Latinx photography was broad, had geographical and generational reach, gestured to the multiracial and gendered identities of Latinos, and included the transnational experiences people are living today. As I stated in my introduction, there is no single story to tell about Latinos. Latinx communities are heterogeneous and have shared yet pluralistic identities made up of people of all races, classes, and gender expressions. So the prospect of trying to capture that within the space of a magazine is quite complicated. But at the same time, our histories and images are so underrepresented, there is no dearth of material to consider. There is so much work that remains to be done in this field. Um, and as with Aperture's issues, Vision and Justice by Sarah Lewis and Native America by Wendy Redstar, which were absolutely incredible, I knew I wanted to push back into images from the 19th century within the scope of the magazine. I wanted to present something that would be um, a push-pull, as Michael mentioned, of culture a, a, across the spectrum of time. And I really wanted to be able to see and look at a span of image making, dipping back into the 19th century up until the present to really glimpse a snapshot of what that can all look like and how broad the Latinx photo photography archive can be. Um, much of my curatorial work has been focused on Latinx art production from the late 60s and early 70s to the present. And on occasion, I've been able to look to earlier periods in my projects, but not to the extent that I would like to. Um, and as we know, Latinos are part of the development of the US from its origins. Yet so much work remains to be done to fill in the historic canon, especially when it comes to art and images of and by Latinx people as part of the intrinsic fabric of the country. Um, and in, in preparation for today, Elizabeth and I were speaking a bit about the overlap between the magazine and her book. And in both of our projects, we talk about the importance of expanding the record and the archive and thinking about both family and documentary photographer, photography as a means to broaden the canon. In my intro, I talk about the fact when I was invited to work on the issue that the first image that came to my mind was a photograph of my great grandfather Juan Sosa, if you, maybe you can go to the previous page because that's where the image is. Um, 
it's that one uh, photograph in the trio um, below. Um, and that's my great grandfather, Juan Sosa, in about 1920 in, in Dallas, Texas. Um, he was born in 1899 in uh, the Comancheria in Oklahoma before Oklahoma was part of the United States. And then his family made, uh, our family made their way to North Texas. And that picture was taken when he was a bicycle messenger for Western Union, and he saved a family from a burning building. So the photo came out in the paper, and that's why we have it. Um, and when I was younger, I really always coveted the few black and white photographs that we had of family members of previous generations. Um, and you see my aunts, my, my great aunts here, as well as my grandparents who are at the top of that page. Um, but I always thought of the photographs as a way to piece together the story of my family and their journey. And in that way, this in working on the issue, I was thinking a lot about the possibilities of what it might be like to consider family vernacular and historic photography, uh, not just my own, but of the 60 million Latinos living in the United States, uh, together that can craft a, a picture of the Latinx experience with some breadth and an impact. I know that more efforts to support the historicization of such photographic resources is really at heart of what the work that lies ahead of us. And I've been talking a lot about the past and deepening our, the desire to deepen our knowledge of it, which was why it was important for me to start with a piece on Ken Gonzalez Day in conversation with Jesse Aleman and, about the archive. Um, it was important for me to capture major movements, photographers and artists that give us some sense of chronology in the field of Latinx photography. Uh, but the title of the magazine is Latinx and that's a term which denotes both inclusivity and also futurity. Um, the issue highlights a number of young artists who are really on the forefront right now in terms of image making. And we'll talk about some of them a little bit later in the conversation. Uh, the portfolios on contemporary photography reflect, uh, reflect on social spaces from home and family to street and nightlife to the in-betweenness that Gloria Anzaldúa termed Nepantla, as well as transnational, multiracial, and post-colonial positionalities. And, you know, in, in some here, kind of wrapping up this part of our conversation, I wanted to say that I really hope that the magazine would be a place for discovery, that it's really just a departure point for sparking conversations and hopefully looking to the areas of research that need to be undertaken by the field at large. Um, I think that the magazine is part of a process of bringing greater visibility to the Latinx archive. And for me, that is an ongoing process that's both about visibility and also deals with questions of belonging. Um, I want to pivot now to looking at work by Vincent Ramos, who thinks about popular culture and, um, and specifically how that exists within the archive uh, in ways that it's circulated, again, going back to the 19th century, but also to periods where we don't necessarily have a lot of familiarity about where Latinx people were in that in that grand archive of image making uh, from the early 20th century to the mid 20th century and all that kind of period before we began to look at the 1960s and 70s, which is a bit better historicized. And Vincent is a collector and an archivist slash artist who's got a really incredible collection of ephemera from pop culture that pertains to just about anything Latinx. Um, his archive includes all types of materials from books and magazine clippings to even bumper stickers, sheet music records, Hollywood studio portraits and advertisements. He once told me that growing up, there was such a lack of images of Latinos anywhere that he could see in television or film or anywhere that whenever he saw something that pertained to Latino culture, he gravitated towards it and kept it. So that's why today he has this pretty incredible archive, which for lack of a better word, is a whole bunch of stuff that functions like a time capsule of images that have some relationship to Latino popular culture. And a lot of what he's collected sheds light on fraught yet interesting chapters from this period of you know, the early to mid 20th century. And there are images of white actors in brown face to play Latino characters on film and TV, uh, Latinos 
who were participating in mainstream media, but who had to mask their Latino identity and anglicize their names in order to work and caricatures and cultural appropriations of Latino culture in other forms of media. And my intention of including this in the, um, in the magazine was to think about the missing parts of the archive and to look at intention at that period and also to kind of bridge back um, uh, in time into images of po popular culture that help us to expand the archive um, into that period of the early to mid 20th century, building on the images from the 19th century before that. Um, and now I'd really love to turn it over to Elizabeth Ferrer, who's gonna talk a bit more about 60s and 70s in this particular piece, cap Capturing the Vinientos. Thank you so much, Pilar. Um, I also want to thank Michael Permaghetti and Emily Stewart for their assistance in putting together this wonderful pan panel. I want to thank you, Pilar, and congratulate you. This issue is a knockout. I love Aperture Magazine. I look forward to it. But when mine arrived, I just couldn't get over the, the richness, the depth, the diversity, um, and everything you've just said that's encapsulated in your uh, your first, uh, your introduction. I mean, there's just so much there. We could pick apart just one part of that and talk about it all evening, but um, we wanna keep moving. Uh, but first I wanna acknowledge that uh, I speak to you this evening from Brooklyn, the traditional and unceded land of the Lenape people. So um, I'm gonna start uh, by kind of painting a picture of the 1960s uh, when this article, with, uh, this article capturing movimientos centers on. Uh, this is an essay by Colin Gunkel, and he focuses on a really pivotal time in Latinx history and also Latinx photography, uh, the 1960s and 70s, when large numbers of brown and black people throughout the United States, and especially young people, took part in the civil rights movement, as well as in protests against the Vietnam War. Vietnam was a big flashpoint for Latinx people because disproportionate numbers of Latinx men were being drafted into the army and they were being killed in the war. So in tandem with these social justice struggles, new expressions of ethnic and cultural pride flourished in barrio neighborhoods, whether in LA, San Francisco, San Antonio, Chicago, New York, and points in between. This was the era when Mexican Americans began to refer to themselves as Chicanos, a politically charged self-legitimizing designation. And on the East Coast, a generation of Puerto Ricans were organizing to fight against oppression and to demand basic human needs. Uh, these were the years in the late 60s when neighborhoods like uh, East Harlem were falling into decay and public schools were literally crumbling. So a confluence of other factors are also coming into play in these years. Uh, this is the period where the first substantial generation of Latinx people are receiving college and graduate degrees, including fine art degrees. And it is often within the academic institutions them themselves that Chicanos and Puerto Ricans are organizing establishing political action groups and publishing newspapers around social justice issues. In the 1960s and 70s, there is also the period when the image culture that we know today is really coming into the fore. This is the era of mass market illustrated magazines and of a mainstream media that was increasingly dominating the cultural narrative. And that's also when photography is becoming more broadly accepted as an art form. So there's, many, many young photographers who are out in the streets documenting these massive shifts in the social and political and the social and political landscape. And they were savvy. They knew that images are loaded and they knew that they had the power to persuade and inform. So as Colin Gunkel notes in the article, grassroots publications like La Raza in Los Angeles and Palante in New York were being established to provide critical counter narratives to what was being read and seen in the mainstream media. If we can go to the next spread. This article has a really strong selection of photographs made by young photographers at protest demonstrations, rallies, and other gatherings. And they really point to the purposes that the, these images serve. They could act as testimony for people and communities that were at best ignored and who were often denigrated. They could provide news and evidence. And this was especially important in countering the distortions and mis misinformation that was offered by the mainstream media and even by the police. And they could act as emblems that could broadly inspire and communicate. So I wanna focus on these two pictures uh, to talk about this really powerful form of image making. Um, each of these images is um, endowed with a great deal of symbolism. So on the left, we see a photo by Frank Espada, 
who actually came of age prior to the civil rights movement. He was born in Puerto Rico in 1904, and he grew up in Brooklyn. Espada became a political activist as early as the late 1940s, and he continued to work as a community organizer through the 1960s. But he was also a photographer, uh, especially in the 1960s and onward. Uh, he never really had the money or time to pursue photography, but in the early 1980s, he received a grant from the NAA that allowed him to travel throughout the United States to document communities that represented the Puerto Rican diaspora. Um, this was a really groundbreaking, important project that um, just is not well known enough because he's photographing Puerto Rican people from New York and the Northeast all the way to Hawaii. And he's talking about the diversity of, of uh, this culture. Um, he's talking about all the contributions that Puerto Rican people are making in the 1960s and this in the 1980s. And this is at a time where there's still a great deal of discrimination. So it was in this uh, project that he made this iconic image of a demonstrator in Washington, DC. Uh, this is a demonstration in support of organized labor. So we see this young man with this intense face and he's wearing an AFL CIO t-shirt. And then we also see the Puerto Rican flag that takes up the majority of the picture frame. So in this one image, we have this clear emblem of Puerto Rican pride and agency and of workers' rights. And then on the right, we have a provocative portrait by George Rodriguez who um, is based in LA and who extensively covered the Chicano civil rights movement. He's especially well known for photographs that he made in 1970 of the Chicano moratorium, which was a massive uh, rally protesting the Vietnam War, uh, which was peaceful, but then because of uh, political intervention became uh, violent. Um, but this uh, image is a portrait. It's of a young woman named Hilda Reyes. Uh, she's just a teenager, um, but I think she has this very strong face. And with the clothes she's wearing, uh, she's declaring her affiliation with the Brown Berets, which was a Chicano civil rights organization, as well with the ideas of the uh, of the Mexican Revolution. I think uh, a little bit of uh, that poster is lost by the the zoom, but um, you can see a, 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 there's a portrait of a Mexican revolutionary soldier. Um, I found this photo really significant because uh, this period in LA and the Chicano movement, it was really largely led by men. There was a lot of machismo, but Reyes and a handful of other women uh, created an another group, Las Adelitas, uh, which is named after the female heroes of the Mexican revolution. And so again, we have this single photo where we see this emblem of female strength an assertion of women's central role in the Chicano movement and a statement of Chicano self-determination and values. Let's go to the um, next spread. Um, these are images that are not in the magazine, but I think it's also really important that we look at work by Hira Maristani, um, who is uh, discussed in the article. Can we go to the next um, set of images, please? Uh, go back, I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. Okay, so these are both by Hiro Maristani, who as you see was born in 1945. Uh, he was born in El Barrio. He lived there all his life. He's, he's still there. Um, he became the official photographer for the Young Lords, a political party and activist group um, that worked for a range of social justice issues in their East Harlem neighborhood. Uh, both of these photographs document East Lord actions. So on the left is a photograph of the garbage offensive, which is an action that they organized in the summer of 1969 to protest the city's lack of sanitation services in El Barrio. Uh, so the young lords, they swept uh, garbage into the street, they set it on fire and they stopped traffic. So they really forced the city to, to take notice, to take action. And they also attracted a great deal of media attention. So again, this really strong understanding of the way that images really have the power to sway opinion and to sway action. And then on the right, we have another photograph of the young lords uh, taking part in this long march that took, part, took place in New York in solidarity with the Black Panthers also in 1969. And, you know, my, and here again, we, here we have two photos that are really made in the heat of the moment. I remember here I'm talking about, he was so often photographing while he was walking backwards because he was taking these uh, photographs at so many demonstrations. And he really understands the photo of the importance of this documentation that he's making. He's making a record of how the Young Lords operated in the public arena. 
And now these photographs, they present to us such a valuable archive and they've really been resurrected in the last few years as uh, a lot of scholars um, have been uh, rethinking the significance of the young lords and now also of uh, Maristani, who's now 75 years old, but finally getting more attention, which he really deserves. And if you're in New York, um, Maristani is actually part of the uh, Greater New York Exhibition at PS1. So you have an opportunity to see the actual work. So there's um, you know, many photographers like uh, Rodriguez in LA and Maristani in New York who are making uh, these kinds of documentary photographs. We're only scratching the surface here. But what I really wanna emphasize is that for the first time, Latinx people begin to have agency over their own portrayals. So if we go to the next page, um, we see a couple of photos where we see these fuller expressions of um, Latinx culture. Uh, the photo on the left is by Luis Garza, who was one of the key photographers with La Raza, which was the Chicano uh, civil rights uh, newspaper and then magazine that I mentioned earlier. And Luis was a very active uh, photographer with La Raza. He covered a lot of protests, marches, and rallies, but also everyday life, you know, these, these, young, these young men. Um, and he worked to create positive representations and to offer a broader picture of life in East LA, which I really appreciate because that's where I grew up. And Maristani and others were doing the same thing in New York. Um, as Colin Gunkel, the author of this article notes, these photographers were forging portraits of resilience, of joy and of creative placemaking. They framed their subjects as active participants in building place and community in the face of rampant inequality. Um, and then I was so interested that this article includes this lesser known um, photographer, Daniel Villarreal, who's actually now much better known as, a, as an actor. But in the 1980s, he was one of several photographers who was really actively documenting the Chicano punk scene in Los Angeles. And it was really vibrant in those years, but not very well known. I don't think it's ever really gotten its due. Um, here, he's taking a picture of the audience at the Vex, which is a now legendary East LA club. Um, he's capturing the audience um, uh, on the night that this uh, uh, group called the Gears were on stage. So this is kind of a more smaller moment, right? But I think that photographers like these who are part of the community, they're um, documenting and they're also creating an archive. Uh, these images are filling in gaps and they're memorializing forgotten histories that weren't recognized by mainstream. Uh, culture. And I was actually just uh, chatting on Facebook with uh, Daniel last night. And, and, you know, he just has so many images like these. And he was telling me about the other photographers who are also active. So I think there's really, you know, space for a book uh, documenting this movement. Um, the documentary work of the 1960s and 70s becomes key in laying the groundwork for a subsequent generation of photographers who are approaching the medium in a more intentionally artistic way. So it's really in this period that photographers are cohering around a consciousness of Chicano or Latinx identity. And they're making work for their own communities. And this ethos would continue even as new forms of photography emerge in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this takes me to Luis Carlos Bernal, who I also want to discuss. Um, and um, so this is a, a primarily a, a portfolio of photographs. Uh, by Bernal, and there's just um, so much to say about him. He's really a towering figure in Latinx photography, and he's somebody who really should be more centrally known in the canon of American photography. Uh, Bernal was born in 1941 in Douglas, Arizona, right on the U.S.-Mexican border, and he began his career in uh, Tucson in the 1970s, and he taught there, and he lived there all his life. He worked in black and white as well as in color, and he photographed Mexican-American people in Arizona, as well as in small towns in Texas, New Mexico, and California. Um, Bernal is a key figure in the generation of Chicano artists who emerged just after the civil rights era. And he was really an early beneficiary of that movement. Um, he had the benefit of higher education. He got a BA as well as an MFA. And um, he had more opportunity really throughout his career, although I, I truly believe that he needs to be better known. Um, his photographs represent a kind of evolution because Bernal was perhaps the first Chicano to envision the possibility of photography as an art form. He shared the commitment to social and racial justice that was 
that's very visible in the work of the um, civil rights era photographers that we just looked at. But Bernal's photographs went well beyond documentation. His work on the Barrio series, we can go to the next, uh, the next spread, please. His, he worked on the Barrio series over many years, meeting people and connecting with them in such a way that people would literally just invite them into their homes. Um, he made portraits that on the one hand act as a form of testimony and, the, and on the other as a deeply intimate form of portraiture that express, expressed the spiritual essence of the people who sat for the camera. So I wanna look at the photograph on the right, those two headers or two women. This is really one of his uh, best known works. He made it in Douglas, Arizona in 1978. Um, and it's really indicative of the way that he worked with his subjects. Um, I really want to emphasize that Bernal would not have necessarily known these people, um, but he made people so comfortable. He was known to be very charming and have a lot of charisma that he would in, people would invite him in. And then he would work with people to, to figure out how he wanted to photograph them. So here we see this, his very precise way of working. So we have in the foreground, this girl working on her sewing against this deep green wall. And then we can look through the, um, the door and see this slightly older woman on her bed. And I, I think that again, the zoom might be covering the window on the side of the room that kind of brings in this, this sort of glow. Um, he could really make uh, threadbare rooms kind of lush because of the way that he used both um, light and color. And um, it's also really important to understand that he's not capturing a moment, right? He really is um, working rather rapidly, but working hard to um, try to capture something about a person's psyche. Um, he didn't have a lot of money and he wasn't able to spend a lot of uh, money on film and printing, especially for color. So he had to work very precisely and very compactly. Um, he would have only exposed a few frames when making a photograph like this. And then let's go forward and then we're gonna go back again, but I wanna show you another, um, I'm afraid, go, let's see, one more. Is there one more by Bernal? Uh, okay, so I guess we're missing a picture that I thought we would have included. But what I wanted to say about those Mujeres is that that image is rather spare. Um, there's a lot of other photographs where there's just this broke display of images of, of Jesus and Mary and other saints and uh, paper flowers and historic photos, um, as in this uh, photograph on the left, and more contemporary portraits. Um, Bernal was just fascinated with images, and I think he was also fascinated with man manifestations of popular culture. And he, a lot of his images sort of function as uh, images of images. So we can um, look at this picture of this um, young boy uh, taken in Douglas, Arizona, again, where he's from. Um, this is also very emblematic of Bernal, you know, very precisely posed photo. And we're not only inside somebody's home, which was his most common way of working, but we're in the bedroom. And I think it's fascinating that he photographed so many people on, you know, on their beds. I, I imagine that these were very small houses and that this was the one small space that people could claim it as their own. Um, this photo is a little different for Bernal because it's, uh, it's a younger person. He tended to gravitate to photographing older people, people that um, exemplified um, traditional ways of life, ways of life that were, that were quickly disappearing, you know, certainly in Tucson uh, where he lived. Um, but he also photographed young people and this young man has a more contemporary look. He has long shaggy hair and jeans. But I think that, that Bernal is, um, really kind of relaying this kind of tension, right? There's these uh, older portraits on either side of him. And I think that this is a young man that probably wants to take part in a more contemporary type of culture, uh, even in Douglas, uh, which was you know, so far away from any cultural center. Um, let's look at the, let's go back again to El Gato, uh, the photograph in front of the pool hall. So I also wanted to, mentioned this photograph because even though uh, Bernal photographed mostly in people's homes or outside their homes around shrines, um, he would also photograph people kind of where they hung out. He would photograph people uh, at weddings, quinceañeras, or, you know, simply in a more casual place like this or in the bar that we saw in the first uh, photograph. And he really wanted to create this a broader picture of Chicano life. Um, so 
and he did so because he was keenly aware that he was bringing forth this new kind of image of Chicano people. I'm, I'm gonna just read something that he wrote, which is uh, just a really important statement by Bernal. He said, my images speak of the religious and family ties I have experienced as a Chicano. I have concerned myself with the mysticism of the Southwest and the strength of the spiritual and cultural values of the barrio. These images are made for the people I have photographed. And, um, you know, in closing about Bernal, for me, that really becomes the crux of a kind of a dilemma of how this kind of community-based work um, gets preserved. He, he wasn't making um, photographs for the marketplace. He did show in galleries. He occasionally sold his work. But um, he, and, he, and I think he would have loved a broader audience, but he experienced a lot of racism, especially in his youth. And that made him reticent to promote his work more broadly. Um, I would say he was successful on his own terms. He was well-known in the Chicano art community. He was also well-known in Mexico. He traveled there often and was well-known among the circle of the best-known Mexican photographers of the 70s and 80s. He had a long and very successful teaching career. And during his lifetime, his work was acquired by several museums. Uh, Bernal tragically died when he was in his early 50s from a bike accident. But thanks to the effort of his two daughters, his archive is now preserved by the Center for Creative Photography uh, at the University of Arizona. And I'm actually working with the center right now to curate a, a large exhibition of his work. And I think for me, it's so, been such an exciting uh, process because what you've just seen right now is really the tip of the iceberg in, in terms of his images. Um, you know, we're, we'll be presenting a, a, a much larger number. And I really hope that this work uh, gets the appreciation it deserves because I think he was, he was um, depicting such a central part of, of the American experience in photographing the way that Chicanos lived throughout the Southwest in the 70s and 80s and 90s. So I'm gonna turn it now back to Pilar. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and now we're gonna, there's so many wonderful photographers in the magazine. I wish we had time to talk about each spread, but um, we can't unfortunately today, although there'll be subsequent conversations that are happening as part of the rollout of programming around the issue, but um, it is important to talk about Laura Aguilar, a very central figure um, in the history of Latinx photography. Um, and I would love for Elizabeth to jump in at any time and it would be great to have a dialogue, but I wanted to just kind of kick this off and really just say a few things about the importance and the lasting impact of Laura's work. Um, this piece was beautifully written by Caribbean Paragosa and it's very poetic and I, and I think appropriately so um, because I, I think she did a wonderful job of gesturing to all of the, um, the poetics of Laura's practice. Um, and, and within this piece, we wanted to not only focus on all of her series, certainly in her, 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 her incredible oeuvre, but really to think about her, her legacy on subsequent generations of Latinx artists and photographers. Um, so in the issue, we look at a few examples, including Star Montana, Jose Villalobos, and El Perez. Um, but I wanted to speak about her work in a very broad uh, way, thinking about all the many entry points into her diverse practice. Um, you know, of course, she's so critically important for addressing LGBTQIA communities within her work, um, such as the image that you saw on the previous page, which is related to um, a series called Plush Pony that um, was uh, shot at a lesbian bar in Northeast LA and has some of my favorite images within um, all, of, all of the works that she ever did. Um, another series that is along the same lines as that is called Latina Lesbians, um, which brings light to the stories and um, personal experiences of her circle. Um, in LA, and the Clothed and Clothed series, um, which we don't have images of here in the presentation, but which also look at um, different types of families um, from LGBTQ families, African American families, and looking at, um, at the way that people find um, uh, um, connections with each other through that structure, through the familial structure, um, as well as looking at ideas of intimacy. Um, but there are many other aspects to her practice, um, 
but deal with her own subjectivity and, and um, issues of, of the body. I mean, you can see a little bit here, um, of course, her, her practice is so um, iconic for the relationship of the, of the body to the landscape. Um, within the kind of story of Laura's work and her practice, um, as, as I've come to know it over time, I really see that, that, um, that, that broad series of, of, herself, of, of her sighting herself within the landscape, usually in the desert in California around Joshua Tree, that it's also part of a journey for self-acceptance. And, and I say that because um, I had the great pleasure of um, working at the Vincent Price Art Museum when we organized the retrospective of her, um, of her work as part of the Gettys Pacific Standard Time LALA uh, initiative in 2017. And it was beautifully curated by Sybil Venegas who contributed some important scholarship to her work through that project and in partnership with UCLA's Chicano Studies Research Center. Um, and there was a really critical need at that time to pay attention to Laura's archive. Um, you know, the CSRC had been the caretaker for her entire archive for many years um, at, at, at the time that we started the project and Laura's health was in decline. And it was so critical and time was really of the essence to, um, to undertake this type of a project. Um, Laura's, Laura's work is so impactful to anyone that sees it. Um, when we stage the exhibition, I can't tell you how many moments happen in the galleries when people were absolutely moved, um, sometimes to tears. Um, in one instance, somebody took their clothes off and took and got naked inside of one of the galleries, which was shocking to me. We don't have, there was not a lot, there weren't a lot of visitors. I think she was alone at the time, but uh, it was alerted to me and I was like, what is going on? But um, someone was really moved, you know, to have a relationship from her personal body to Laura's body and, and saw it as, um, as a moment of, of feeling empowered. Um, so, um, you know, this, this work was presented at, at the museum, at Vincent Price Art Museum at East LA College where Laura had also gone to school and learned photography. And uh, the community of young people that go to school there, um, you know, are dissimilar from Laura herself. And, um, and it was just really incredible to see the kind of urgency with which they wanted to consume the images on site. And I got the, the chance to see that every every day. Um, I mean, before the show took place, it was a, a desire to try to tour the exhibition, um, but tried as I as I could, I couldn't get any takers for that, um, and approached about ten museums across the country, and uh, and and no one was interested in traveling the exhibition. And I and I feel it was because even though she had some presence in the '90s and had had some opportunity to, you know, to, to, to gain some national recognition at other points in her life, people just really didn't know the work. And once we were able to um, go through the archive, develop the exhibition, develop the catalog, have the support structure of something like that initiative and, uh, and receive press, as soon as we did, the tides turned and museums came calling, other larger museums came calling and that the exhibition ended up touring, you know, to Miami and Chicago and and New York and um, and major institutions across the country were reaching out to see how they might acquire her work for their collections. Um, you know, it was it was a big undertaking at that time. We lost Laura, unfortunately, within that period, and um, and that was you know incredibly sad that that she was not able to see that that full bloom, if you will, of her work moving into all of these institutional collections and traveling across the country. Um, and I feel like that's a, a, just a travesty <laughs> what, that we're facing with the field of Latinx photography in general, that there aren't enough people doing work around it um, to, to work with these collections, to work with the archives. Um, I know that's always, you know, a, an, an issue and a, and a story that we hear again and again that an artist doesn't receive, you know, kind of recognition until it feels that it's too late or it's passed them by. But that certainly was a difficult thing to experience um, over the course of, you know, working with Laura on, on this project. But the impact and the, and the legacy of her work is something that I 
I really, you know, truly believe will be relevant and, uh, and, and very special for generations of artists and photographers for years to come. And we, we, we talk about a few of those people within, um, within, this, uh, within this article, but, you know, I also wanted to just, you know, say we, you know, it was really wonderful to see, um, Elizabeth, you talk about some of the images, you know, um, that you mentioned, you know, you mentioned Frank Espada, which I wanted to give a shout out to the Lucas Museum because we recently acquired his archive. And, um, and, are, and have brought that into the museum's collection. And I'm really, really looking forward to working with the archive um, and, and also brought in works by a couple of the other photographers you mentioned, including George Rodriguez and, and Hira Marstani, as well as Perla de Leon, who's in the, who's in the issue. Um, you know, I just really challenge any museum professionals who are watching out there today to bring Latinx photography into your collections. Um, there are so many incredible photographers who've been working diligently and their archives um, need to be cared for and their, their stories need to be told. And, and Laura, you know, is, is, you know, really someone who's emblematic of that, that, you know, the attention needs to be given to um, the work and the over of these incredible photographers. Yeah, Pilar, what you're talking about, I think there's a really a lot of urgency, you know, uh, Frank has passed, um, Hiram and George are both in their 70s. Uh, Perla de Leon um, is also older. Uh, we have the Puerto Rican photographer in uh, New York, Sophie Rivera, who recently passed. So yeah, these are all archives. And you know, some of them will be preserved, I believe, and others may not. And um, you know, this whole generation uh, represents um, really pioneering visions. And um, uh, they, you know, they were making work when they had few role models often without the benefit of education. Um, so it's, it's very, very important work. But to, to go back to, to Laura, I think, um, you know, I, I saw that show at Vincent Price and I thought that I knew Laura's work pretty well. I was so uh, impressed by the diver diversity of her work. I mean, I think a lot of us maybe know a couple different works, maybe the plush pony work or the nudes, but she uh, was, a real risk taker, and she was was really somebody who was willing to experiment. And I I think there's just so much more about Laura that uh, Laura Aguilar that needs to be um, investigated. And another thing I just wanted to mention, you know, going back to like especially that plush pony work, um, you know, Laura herself was uh, was queer. She was uh, a, a large woman. She had some learning disability. You know, and I think, and, and especially when she was first starting out, you know, in the Chicano community, uh, you know, it was not easy to be a lesbian. Um, so she was experiencing like these double, triple, uh, quadruple levels of marginalization. And so here's a photographer that is showing, you know, some of the greatest degree of vulnerability that we can imagine. But especially when we look at a photo like this, I think what's so important to think about is that she's also working very much to create community, right? I think you mentioned that she wants to find her community. And so on the one hand, you know, she can find it in a place like the plush pony. Uh, but on the other hand, she's also grappling with her own identity. So when we see these other images of her, you know, in the landscape and, you know, in this very isolated Texas landscape where she's alone, um, you know, that's, that's the opposite side, right? That's just kind of, you know, um, working through herself and her own identity. And I just think it's 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 so poignant and so powerful to look at the way that Laura was able to create these kinds of images despite these various kinds of hardships that she herself lived through. And um, you know, it's it's really wonderful that she's getting attention now. I know when the show came to the Leslie Lohman Exhibition uh, Museum, it got a lot of attention. And um, one of the things that I find with Latinx photography is that there are photographers who are maybe really well known in LA or really well known in New York, but not vice versa. And finally, Laura is a, uh, a photographer whose work is, be, is being seen nationally thanks to this exhibition. And I think it's just being appreciated by a lot of different audiences. So, you know, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that her work will remain well preserved and, and uh, that there will be a lot more scholarship and exhibitions. That's my sense too. And, you know, and, and it really, you know, I think it's, it really reflects on the notion that, you know, having, having a, paying attention to and having concerted effort, 
around um, an artist practice and going in deep, um, you know, they're working working within the archive. I mean, there. I think we presented something like 130 photographs in that show, but that was also, you know, just a, a selection um, from the depth of that archive, which, you know, is now making its way into institutional collections. And I believe it will, you know, be part of, you know, future exhibitions. And I really look forward to seeing future scholarship around around her work. Um, you know, you spoke to that idea of community and that's also kind of, undercurrent in in the um, in the magazine and um, and that need and desire for us to find ourselves within image making and find our community through um, the images that 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 bring us together um, that image of plush of the plush pony that's in the um, that's on the previous page was a big blow up banner on the exterior of the museum and I was closing the museum one day and this young man came running from the bus stop to the door and tried to like practically force his way in as I was locking up and he saw he had seen the picture and it meant something to him it resonated with him he felt like he was to be honest being seen by seeing that image and he said, what is this place? And I said, this is an art museum. <laughs> what is this? What's going on? And, uh, and, and it was, we had a conversation and I invited him back, of course. And, um, and it was really, you know, moving, um, a moving experience as there were many that I kind of mentioned that I saw transpire within the galleries um, as people began to see themselves reflected in the walls of the institution. Um, so, um, yeah, I just want to kind of end, maybe end on that and, and, I want to save some time to talk about some of the younger artists that are also within the spreads. Um, so uh, let's talk about William Camargo. Um, William is an artist working in Orange County in Southern California. I'm just going to speak briefly about, um, about everyone uh, that I've lined up here so we can save some time for questions. Um, but you know, his work is really drawing attention to Latinx histories in the region and, and um, you know, those are not as obvious in Orange County, even though it's adjacent to LA County, um, but he is telling, you know, stories, uh, historic stories about the, the, um, the history of agriculture and, and also segregation in that area. But a lot of his work really focuses on gentrification and it's drawing attention to processes of erasure that are not always visible, but have generational impact on communities of color. And that's what is happening within this um, series here. Um, maybe we can move on to Stephen Molina Contreras um, and his um, work, which deals with his family. And these are a, a suite of, of really beautiful reflections um, on, on the connections between multiple generations within his family. Um, one of the things that I think is really significant is that his family is split between El Salvador and Long Island. So the work is, you know, drawing attention um, to the ways that many families are, are spread across these transnational contexts and how do you maintain your ties and your communication. Um, I think in his work, it also, something that really stands out to me is the portrayal of women and girls in the family. Um, which are portrayed in a really strong and, and beautiful uh, manner. And, and even though the methodology of his work is different, I think there's something for me that kind of harkens back to Luis Carlos Bernal. Um, maybe we could move on to Star Montana, who I mentioned briefly in relationship to Laura Aguilar. Um, she also studied at East LA College like Laura and um, also worked with Laura's same mentor, um, May Valenzuela. Um, and, and like Laura, her work is very personal and, and powerfully so. Um, a lot of her work is dealing with um, telling the intergenerational stories of trauma within her family. And she's really processing a lot, processing loss um, and using her family photographs um, to tell that story. So she's kind of mining her own personal archive, her family's archive um, to, to highlight and bring attention to um, ways in which families have been shaped by the communities that they are in, embedded within. Um, let's move on to Gabriela Ruiz and, um, and Bibbs Moreno. Um, 
and really the work is an interesting collaboration here within this um, within this spread. Um, Gabrielle is the subject of the photographs and all the images, even though they're very different, are all taken by Bibbs Morena. And Gabriella is a transdisciplinary artist who's mixing studio practice with performance and fashion and, and modeling. Um, and, and I'm really intrigued by her work. I think that she's thinking a lot about um, questions of beauty as well as the body, but um, in some of her in some of her paintings and sculptures, which you wouldn't necessarily see reflected here, it's also you know thinking about technologies. Um, uh, and surveillance technology specifically. Um, she also is really invested in DIY aesthetics. So you can see a lot of these um, costumes that she's made and it's really kind of speaking to a way that she's constantly reinventing herself. And she has said that Bibbs is her favorite photographer to, to work with. And I, and I think she's done some beautiful, beautiful images. Um, Let's talk about uh, the next artist, um, Joydi Minaya. Um, really happy to have a beautiful piece um, on her work by the writer Angie Cruz, um, whom I really admire. And uh, and Joydi's work for me is about you know subverting assumptions about women uh, from the Caribbean um, and as well you know as Dominican women and thinking about constructs of identity. And in these pieces, she's appropriating images of Dominican women, which appear to be used for prom uh, promoting tourism, something that you might see on a postcard or a poster, but mixing that with historic photographs and historic paintings, as well as tropical prints, which you can kind of see in this, in this image. And, and, and I, I'm really fascinated by the way that the figure is camouflaged within the pattern and the image throughout her work. Um, she's also did a really incredible video um, um, that is called Cibue about the referencing the Cuban song. And it's, I love this, I love this image. It's still from the video um, in which she's, it's, she's really put together something that is a performance as well as a mural painting and a video. And, um, and she's painted this wall kind of a tropical pattern and then eventually she's immersing herself and wiping away the landscape that she's created. And, and lastly, Sofia Cordova. Um, all of the images in this next group um, are from a three channel video installation that have been translated um, into photographs for the magazine. And within this work, she's juxtaposing um, the movements and actions of dancers, which you can see in some of the smaller boxes um, which you would see activated within uh, the video itself, um, uh, together with film footage and still photography of different periods of, of revolution and revolutionary events. And I think in this work that she's, she's really commenting on both individual and collective action within the context of the, the push for social change. And Sophia is, a, um, is based in Oakland. She's May I turn it over to you, um, Elizabeth, to close this out? Absolutely. So we wanted to end by talking about Guadalupe Rosales because um, so many of the themes that we've been talking about, so family and community, um, the importance of sort of self-agency, uh, taking control of one's image, and about the preservation of the image and of the archive, I mean, all that is visible. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, my video is not on. Okay, so, you know, all of that is, is visible in Guadalupe's work. Uh, she founded a, the site called Veterana Salucas, an Instagram site. Um, she started in 2015. And while Guadalupe is an artist in her own right, she's created the site as a platform, uh, one for the democratization of the image. And she's using social media as a tool for racial justice and for social preservation. Um, these images are so important to me because these are the kinds of images that you know we all have you know in our photo albums or in boxes that we've all seen. Um, she originally started uh, Veteranas and Rukas to document the party crew scenes of the 1990s. This was something that she was part of as an adolescent, but she quickly broadened it out to include um, 
uh, photographs that were submitted to her by friends and later by you know other people, uh, other Chicano people in the Southwest. So there are more historic photographs as well as these more contemporary photos. And she's really creating this sort of archive of who we have been over the last you know, century or so. It's become this very, very powerful site. Um, it's had a tremendous impact. I think that um, Guadalupe has something like 270,000 followers. And um, it really simply points to the fact that we really want to kind of see our own image, share our own, our own image. And um, it also shows that social media align, you know, can really has the capacity for us to, um, you know, share these images and preserve them. She's also influenced um, the establishment of other sites. Um, so there's uh, one that is called Baba Yorkinos, which is called an OG, uh, a love letter to OG New York. Um, also Rock Archivo LA and uh, the Latinx Diaspora Archives, uh, which is, was founded by William Camargo, who you just discussed. Um, so for me, all of these sites uh, point to a desire to share reflections of our own lives and values. And really in a sense to, you know, to reconstitute community. Um, this kind of work uh, confronts mainstream narratives and it's a way of resisting invisibility. Um, so, you know, I'm always excited to see what uh, uh, Guadalupe has, has shared on a single day and the kinds of comments uh, because it's been a very powerful um, artistic project. Uh, are you are you done, Elizabeth? Or I am. Okay, I, I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, well, thank you both for that um, fantastic, rich, and incisive um, walk through the issue. I feel like I'm seeing it with fresh eyes. Um, it was just wonderful. And so great to end on Guadalupe uh, Rosales, who was featured on the cover of our 2018 Los Angeles issue. And Guadalupe led me to Pilar, which led to this issue of the magazine. So the reverberation through Guadalupe's work can continues. Um, I want to, I love what Pilar said at the beginning of the talk about the magazine being a departure point for sparking conversations. And we, of course, have many questions from the audience. Um, and I just want to start with one where um, somebody asks, how do we learn about our photographic legacy when so many archives have not been preserved? How do we learn more about those who came before us as Latinx photographers? I think that's a great question. And, you know, you know, kind of going back to what I was talking about with regards to the introduction is I felt like I couldn't see enough images of work and uh, production and to know the stories that push beyond, you know, see like five decades prior, but looking beyond that was um, so much harder. I mean, it's really been, I still feel like this is a recovery process that lies ahead of us. Um, you know, there, and, and maybe it's something that will just take time. You know, if I look back at exhibition histories that have taken place over the past, you know, 10, 20 years, that it, you know, that there's a moment when we're, you know, looking at the social movements of the 60s and 70s, and then, you know, it broadens a little bit and, the field begins to expand and begins to be more inclusive of, uh, of Latinx art and a kind of historical focus that gives us some footing to talk about the next thing. Um, so I, I guess for me, you know, in, in my own curatorial practice, I feel like there's an unfolding that's taking place. If you push a little bit further and push a little bit further, then it gives you a chance to uncover something else. I, I, I do feel like the, you know, the field is growing and there's more and more um, you know, people out there who are, who share the interest and that also you know share the the call to to do this labor and um, and I you know I certainly think you know Elizabeth your book you know too has been so critical and important. I mean, as I mentioned just at the beginning too, you have to have something like this in order to be able to teach it um, within the university setting because if the art historical canon isn't open enough to include this, let alone a museum context. Um, you know, you're not also, you know, cultivating the next generation of people who will come in and, and do the work and do the labor. So I, I see all these things as intertwined and, um, and it's just a long project that lies ahead of us. 
Yeah, I totally agree, Pilar. And I mean, that's why I wrote the book. You know, I, I saw the book in many ways as a text. I didn't re- write it as a textbook, but I certainly hoped that it would be used that way. And um, the book, st- my book starts in earnest uh, with the civil rights era, with the, with the late 1960s. And there, I include a handful of photographers who were active earlier. Um, but what always troubled me was what do, what do I not know? You know, there was no standard book or text of reference for me to go back to. I would find these threads of information and dig and find out certain things. But I just, you know, wonder what is lost, uh, lost to time or maybe hidden in historical societies or, you know, in people's photo albums. There's, there's, there's so much more. This is a, a really ripe area for young scholars um, because I think my, I always see my book as a beginning. And you know, to see the issue of the magazine come out about a year after my book came out, I mean, that was just, for me, so gratifying to see that we're gonna build on each other's scholarship. And there's gonna be you know, more exhibitions you know, like the Laura Aguilar show, like the Luis Carlos Bernal show, there will be others. So it will change and there will be more information. There will be this building of information, but it, it's gonna take a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it's really an exciting field to, to work with because there's, um, there's a lot to discover. And uh, what we ha- I think what we've both seen is that there are many, many people who are interested in uh, being able to access this kind of information and these kinds of images. Uh, related to that, there's a question of um, what institutions are supporting this kind of work right now? Maybe if there are any institutions we could point the audience to. Well, I mentioned our own work at the Lucas Museum, which has been really exciting. You know, we actually had a, a definitive, you know, moment when we were looking at acquisitions and having a, a specific focus on Latinx photography, um, Latinx artists, and within that Latinx photography, which you know led us to the Spada Archive and additional um, additional uh, artists. So, um, at least in in where I'm at right now, that's one of the things that has been really important. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, the, um, do you, who, whom else are you aware of? Well, that? I would also just point to the Center for Creative Photography um, at the University of Arizona that has the Bernal Archive, and, you know, which really has the resources to preserve these kinds of, um, you know, massive archives. They also, you know, hold photographs by Ansel Adams and, you know, Edward Weston and people like that. So, you know, they're definitely interested, and I think, I think that's going to grow. I think one other thing is that some of these archives are in, are in universities um, and in um, libraries that are not as accessible, but, but they are, there is work that is being preserved, um, but it is not necessarily always in these big museums. Um, you know, and of course it's not work that can always, can always be seen. Um, so, um, you know, it's dependent on curators to want to create these exhibitions so that the work actually gets on the walls and can be seen by a larger public. Yeah, I would echo that and just say there, you know, I think about, you know, how how the archive exists and that it might be in other types of um, institutions, you know, they're kind of, as you, you know, mentioned, historic societies, and I think there's a lot to be done that, you know, that can really um, craft exhibitions that give us some breadth, give us some opportunity to, um, to think about ways in which Latinx art hasn't always been considered part of the canon of art history at all. Period. That's not a given. So it may be it may be out there in a lot of other places that have been a little are a little bit off of our radar. Um, those of us you know who are working in the museum field or um, as art historians, because there has been a push you know for a very long time to even just have a space within uh, within the discourse of art in and of itself. Yeah, I would also like to point to the Latinx project at NYU, you know, which is not a museum per se, but now has a, a gallery space. And they've been doing a lot of work with um, uh, photographers, including William Camargo, and have been mounting some shows. Um, so that's another great resource. They also have a rich website with a lot of information. Mm-hmm. Well, you've just answered one other question, which is, are there any upcoming exhibitions that we can look forward to? And obviously, Elizabeth's exhibition of um, Louis... Carlos Bernal is one. When does that open? Is uh, fall twenty twenty three. Okay, wonderful. And Pilar, I know, is working on something with Aperture that we will be telling you more about soon. Um, and here's another question: Is there a continuity between Latinx photography and Latin American photography? Is the approach different in that Latin America are countries and Latinx is marginalized? 
Uh, that's a really good question. And something I, I've been thinking about um, specifically with Bernal, who, you know, who was um, active in the 1970s and 80s. And as I mentioned, he, um, he went to Mexico often. He, um, I think, sort of found like a kind of cultural and intellectual home there. And he took part in a couple of the big colloquiums of Latin American photography uh, that took place in the late 1970s and early 1980s. I feel like for somebody like Bernal of that generation, Mexico actually was a really important touchstone because it did provide him with a reference point, uh, since a kind of inspiration that he wasn't necessarily seeing uh, in the United States. And, you know, there was, there's a lot of sort of uh, work, uh, kind of street photography documentary work that I think Bern that Bernal could point to as being important for his own vision. But I think with younger generations, I think it's much different. I think that the Latinx art and photography community has grown and evolved in a way that we're looking to our own references now. We're looking to our own our own histories, our own cultures, and um, our own. And I don't think that the need exists so much to look to look to Latin America. Pilar, I don't know if, you know if you agree with that or if you want to expand on that. You know, I've, I've worked a lot in Latin America, and I I. The funny thing is that Latin America doesn't really recognize Latinx, you know, artists as part of that, you know, space, and so, um, you know, that that it's 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 all. I think it's a challenge. I mean, I think that it's just it's still we're still building bridges and things are still opening up and we're having more, you know, cross um, cross border, you know, conversation and and relationship. So I feel like there's. Um, you know, that, that, that intertwinement, you know, is something that you can't necessarily trace a continuum of, of uh, across the two. They've had different types of, of tracks. You know, and I would also just add that um, I think Mexican photography is pretty well known in the United States, and there have been many opportunities to see shows at big museums of Mexican photographers, but Latin American uh, photographers don't necessarily know Latinx photographers and, and vice versa. Um, so I don't know that the, the relationships are there as strongly. You know, there was this era when there were these uh, colloquiums of Latin American photography. Uh, in, in a couple of cases, um, especially Chicano photographers were invited to come down and take part, but nothing like that is happening right now. So there's not necessarily the easy kind of interchange and sharing of knowledge that actually might've existed in the seventies and eighties, you know, before the internet era. Mm -hmm. Um, it's been pointed out that Museo del Barrio has a current photography exhibition and a long and consistent track record of photography shows and catalogs, um, just to note. Um, so we are actually just about out of time. Pilar or Elizabeth, is there anything else that you would like to add? Um, I also just want to mention that the Q&A is actually, there, are, there is more just um, kind of outpourings of appreciation and love in the, in the comments section um, and people just um, commenting on how much they appreciate and enjoyed this talk. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, but is there anything else that you wanted to add? Um, no, I'm also just reading some of the things in the chat as well, and thank you for everyone who's putting in all the resources and, um, and additional information, you know, about other shows and other ways that people can connect um, to this material and, um, and you know, I, there are other talks upcoming related to the issue, so um, you know, I'm really grateful to Aperture for organizing this and for F uh, um, additional conversations that are going to transpire, and I, I'm really excited that um, you know it's a moment you know between Elizabeth's project and you know what Almost Barrio is doing, what other entities out there are doing. That there is attention um, that's being placed on uh, on image making and photography by Latinx artists in the U.S. Super excited, and thank you. And I just want to mention to everyone that um, if you registered for this talk, you will be, you'll get an email that will tell you about the upcoming talks that we have connected to the issue. We have two more programs planned, one for later this month and one for February um, that I'm sure will be equally fantastic as tonight. Um, Pilar, thank you so much um, for everything. And thank you so much, Elizabeth um, Ferrer, for being here with us tonight. Um, thank you. Really fantastic to have you both. Good night, everyone. Thank you.